Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Hom and I've been honing my hand lettering skills for more than seven years. In my Adobe Max session, I'll be talking about how silly projects can lead to serious career opportunities, how to leverage the mundane bits of life into creative ideas, and how to have more fun with your work. I hope it leaves you inspired. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for coming to my session. This is my first time speaking at Adobe Max, and I'll be sharing uh, how to build a serious career by making silly work. So I hope you're all excited to start uh, adding a little bit more fun to your work. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren Hom, and I am a hand lettering artist. And like a lot of you in this room, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an artist. My parents dug this up. Uh, from the archives. I feel like every good design talk has like a baby photo or two. So I thought I'd just get that out of the way right out of the gate. And if you look really closely, it says, when I grow up, an artist. Um, so we're going to forgive my six-year-old grammar and just, we know what I meant. And so, so many kids want to be artists, firemen, astronauts, you know, cr doing or doing something creative when they grow up. And as you grow up, I think over the next decade, I was six in this picture, Life taught me that art is just a hobby. It's not actually a serious career. And to be honest, I listened. Uh, when I graduated high school, instead of going into art or illustration, I decided to go into advertising because it seemed like a more practical option. Um, it seemed like I could make more money and it just would make my parents happier. And so I went into advertising. And luckily, as time went on, I found my way back to that creating just for fun like I did when I was a kid. And I have been able to build a serious career doing art. I'm here speaking to you as a hand lettering artist, didn't end up following through on that ad thing. And I have worked on serious projects, like this line of Hallmark cards that I did in 2015, or being interviewed for MailChimp's homepage and getting to do the artwork for it. I got so many emails and text messages from friends this day. I do gift cards for Target, um, which is cool because my grandma shops there, and so you can see it in the wild. That's kind of how I gauge how big my clients are, as if my grandma goes to the store, it's probably a pretty big store. Here's a photo of me finding it in the wild for the first time. <laughs> my boyfriend insisted that we take a picture. But, and then, oh, two summers ago, I got to paint a mural at Google's VR headquarters in uh, San Francisco, or right in, right in the Bay Area. and. When I was a student, I used to look around at my favorite designers like Jessica Hish and Dan Cassaro, John Contino, doing all this cool type work and landing all these big projects. And I would think to myself, how the fuck did they get those projects? <laughs> you know, were they really hardworking? Did they know somebody in the industry? Were they just so much more talented than everybody else? Were they just lucky? I had no idea. And the truth is, I have no idea still. Everyone's path is completely different, and honestly, it's probably a combination of all three of those things, plus a couple extra things sprinkled in. And there's no singular path to success, just as there isn't a singular definition of success, too. And I'm really excited to be here sharing my story with you all, because my path to success, or my technique that I use, is really fun to talk about. Because it's actually fun. So fun is my secret sauce to creating, uh, you know, building my serious career. And even though I've done a lot of serious projects, like the ones I just showed you, those aren't the projects that people actually know me for. No one comes up to me and asks about my Target gift cards. People come up to me and they go, oh, you're Lauren Hom. You're the one who does daily dishonesty. Or, oh, you're the one who makes ex-boyfriend tears. Or, wait, aren't you the girl on Instagram who puts the bread on her head? If anyone's confused, I'll explain this in a little bit, don't worry. But while I was writing this talk, I realized that every single serious career opportunity that I've had over the course of the last seven years is because, or directly stems from, a silly passion project that I created. And I realized that you can build a serious career by making not so serious work, because that's what I've done over the last seven years, and it's worked for me, and I'm really excited to share with you all um, how you, can do, how you can do the same. And so, you know, as kids, we are normally silly and lighthearted. And as time goes on, we learn to be more practical and to be more serious. And so here's second baby photo. There you go. 
Here's me as a kid, super silly, liked to play, liked to be weird, wasn't afraid to be weird. I think that's a big part of as we grow up, we get self-conscious. And as I was growing up, though, I heard messages like this. You can only eat dessert after you eat all your vegetables or after you finish your dinner. So the fun stuff comes after. You know, work for 40 years, and then you can go retire and relax and travel and do all the things you wanted to do, but you're just going to be really tired. Or, you know, these kind of mantras of, you know, work hard, you know, it's all no pain, no gain. While there is definitely a time and place for these kind of sentiments, I don't think that they're necessarily the only path that we can take. I used to think that if, we just, if I just worked harder than everybody else, I would be successful. But the thing about working hard is that it only works for a little while. And this tends to go really well when you're in your late teens, early 20s, or starting your career where you have the stamina to work really hard and to pull the late nights. Um, but this is why so many creatives end up burning out because working hard and staying late and doing more than your other coworkers isn't the most sustainable, and that's why we end up burning out. I burnt out eventually, but before we get to that point, I want to take us back to a little bit of a happier time. So, this is almost exactly a year ago. I mean, not a year, seven, oh my gosh, seven years ago. So wild. On October 8th, 2012, my roommate Sophie and I ate a small wheel of cheese and shared two bottles of wine. And we were just going into our senior year at the School of Visual Arts. We were both studying advertising and graphic design. And we, as we dug into the cheese and the wine, we started talking about all the things we wanted to do in our spare time that year. She wanted to learn how to brew her own beer. I wanted to go to Bikram Yoga every day. And by the end of the first bottle of wine, we decided we were going to start a baking blog. And so, after we talked about the baking blog and the name and all that stuff, we, there was a moment where we looked up at each other, a little bit drunk, and realized that we were totally full of shit and not going to do any of those things. For anyone who's ever been to a you know, design school or in a design program, senior year is the busiest year. You're worrying about getting a job. And so we burst out laughing because we realized we weren't going to do all of those things. They were just kind of like, you know, nice to have. They're like, I would love to do that. Your aspirational self, where you, you, these are all the things you wish you could do, but you, then you got to be realistic. And so after this moment, I had an idea. I was like, huh, I lie to myself all the time like this, innocently, of course. And so I ran to my room and sketched out a few ideas. And within a week, Daily Dishonesty was born. And so what Daily Dishonesty was, was a collection of hand-lettered little white lies that my girlfriends and I all told to ourselves on the regular. So things like, I'll be there in five minutes. I've read and agreed to the terms and conditions. Just one bite. I'll do the dishes later. I was going to say, if you have roommates, you know this one. But even when I was living alone, I definitely would do the dishes later. One time, I think I went through every single dish in my apartment until I got to Tupperware. And then I knew I had to, had to do the dishes. And so I was just publishing these to a Tumblr blog. I was drawing these on graph paper in my room and you know, scanning them in, manipulating, ma manipulating them a little bit in Photoshop, and posting them to a Tumblr blog for anyone who still uses Tumblr. And it caught this weird wave of the internet. People started actually following along. And before I knew it, Daily Dishonesty was getting written up on different design blogs. And it started circulating around the internet. And I had 1,000 followers and then 10,000 followers. And it was really reaffirming that, oh, other people think this is funny. Um, I just made this for me and my friends because we relate to this. But it turns out other people like it too. They were sharing it with their friends. And so about two months after I launched Daily Dishonesty, I get an email from a woman named Catherine. And she says, hey, I stumbled across your work on Pinterest. I think that this daily dishonesty thing has publishing potential. Do you want to talk? And if you look at the date, uh, this is actually my 21st birthday, so that was pretty exciting. But at the time, I was like, who offers a 21-year-old a book deal? This must be a scam. There's no way. And there's one thing before we continue that I want to zoom in on. Is she said she found me on Pinterest. And the reason I thought it was a scam was because I didn't have a Pinterest account at the time. So I was like, how could she have possibly found it? And this is the power of the internet. You know, People share things that make them laugh. And this is what I like to call lazy marketing. When you make things that make people laugh, they send them to their friends. 
Someone had obviously repinned this to one of their Pinterest boards and it started circulating organically. So when you make things that are funny or shareable or at least relatable, other people do the work for you and that's really you know, the best. And you can think of it as, I like to call it the group text test. You know, we all have our group texts with our, with our best friends that we share memes in and funny things that happened. Think about what you would share in that group and that kind of humor is a really great place to start for the kind of silly work that you might make someday because you'll appeal to people who are just like you and your friends. So I ended up contacting Catherine. We had a meeting and I realized, oh, this could be a thing. So we worked together and within another six months, we had sold Daily Dishonesty into a book. And so the same week that I was graduating college, I was also signing a five-figure book deal, which felt absolutely nuts. And in September 2014, Daily Dishonesty hit the shelves. I submitted it to award shows. I ended up winning a Webby Award for this. Um, and it actually led to one of my big, or first big editorial projects. So Daily Dishonesty had gotten featured on a type blog and I got an email from the creative director at Los Angeles Magazine who said, hey, I saw one of your pieces on type everything. This is exactly what I'm looking for for our feature article. Do you want the job? And I was like, yes. This was the first magazine I had ever been contact contacted by that my parents might have known about. I grew up in LA, so it was nice that they could go to the newsstands and find it. And so this came out in February 2014, I want to say. And within six months, I had tons of other clients lined up for editorial work as well. So Daily Dishonesty was the direct catalyst for getting my foot in the door with editorial work. And I've probably done 40 editorial pieces at this point. And so if we look back, <laughs> how many of you have gotten drunk with your friends or just gotten drunk? Pretty much everybody, right? Lots of people. So that was the catalyst, the silly action of drinking too much with my roommate was the catalyst for all of this wonderful stuff to happen. I made a project from it that maybe it would turn into nothing, but it did turn into something. I got a book deal at the age of 21 or 22. I can't even remember now, but I was young. I won awards, which boosted my career started getting freelance work, and all of these things combined were what I used to pitch myself to agents when I was ready to look for an illustration agent, and that's how I landed my agent. So the moral of the story is to take yourself seriously, but don't take your ideas too seriously. So what Daily Dishonesty taught me was, oh, people like my work, they're sharing it, you know, design blogs are writing about it, I'm winning awards, maybe I could be a hand letterer someday. It helped me to start taking myself seriously. And I would put you know, the awards on my website. And when working with Catherine, the literary agent, taught me to, you kind of have to pump yourself up more to make other people start to take you seriously. So every little win that you have in your career, post about it, share it, put it on your website, make yourself seem like a bigger deal than you actually are, and the rest will follow. Obviously, don't lie about anything, but celebrate your wins, because when you take yourself seriously, other people will too. Wherever you set the bar is where other people will follow or fall right underneath, you could, you could say. But don't take your ideas too seriously. Like I said, daily dishonesty could have been absolutely nothing, but it turned into all these things that catapulted my lettering or launched my lettering career. And honestly, without it, I don't think I'd be standing here on stage talking to all of you. So even when you're following the fun and you're playing with your silly ideas, fear can still creep back in. And it did for me. So even when I graduated, with a book deal, could have jumped into lettering, had some freelance work. I couldn't bear the thought of not using my advertising degree. I studied ad and I didn't want to let my parents down and I felt like it was just a waste of four years. And so I decided to get a full-time job. And for anyone who is on the fence of like, oh, I don't really like my job, but should I leave? It's okay to stay at the job. It's okay to try something and figure out if you like it. I ended up leaving, of course, because I'm here. <laughs> Imagine I still wasn't, but it's okay. You, the fear will creep back in no matter how much fun you're having, no matter how confident you are, and you have to be gentle with yourself. If you make a mistake, no big deal. You live and you learn. So I got a full-time job, and also around this time, I went through a breakup, and it wasn't a good breakup, not one of those we can still be friends kind of things, and I remember I was sitting at my desk with my coworker while I was working at the ad agency and I was complaining about my ex-boyfriend and I noticed a block of post-it notes on the desk uh, near me and just on a whim, because I was feeling sassy, wrote the words, 
ex-boyfriend tears on the post-it note and stuck it to my water bottle, and he luckily took a picture. Every time I see my long hair, I totally miss it, but I like my short hair now. So, took a picture, I kept it on my desk for the rest of the day, and every coworker who walked by was like, that's so funny, that's so great, can I take a photo of that? And I had the light bulb go off in my head again where I was like, huh, maybe this could be a thing, other people are relating to it. And so I went home that night and opened up Adobe Illustrator and whipped this up, whipped up the Ex-Boyfriend Tears logo, found a flask manufacturer online and started Ex-Boyfriend Tears with a small test batch. And because I had built such a big following on Daily Dishonesty and the humor was kind of in the same vein, I decided, hey, I'm gonna tell my Daily Dishonesty followers about Ex-Boyfriend Tears because maybe they'd like it too. So I posted it on the Daily Dishonesty blog and posted a little bit about the project. I originally did a cup, a mug, and I think shot glasses at one point, but then I quickly learned that fragile things are not good to ship, so I stuck with just with the flask. Oh my gosh, the first orders that I shipped out, I think I wrapped the glasses in like newsprint and they all arrived smashed, and I had to give everybody a refund or send them a new one. Anyways, so I put this out there, went back to work, and Three hours later, I check on the post and it had 12,000 likes and reblogs. And I was like, what happened here? So I went back in like the Tumblr reblog history and noticed that the author John Green was following Daily Dishonesty and had reblogged it onto his Tumblr. And he had millions of followers. And then I checked my orders and I had sold out of all my pre-orders because someone famous had reblogged it. So you never know who's looking. Um, it's pretty hard to tell to look at all your followers or to really know who's paying attention, even someone who doesn't follow you. The internet's weird. We've all been, you know, 50 clicks deep into something and not known how we ended up on a page. So that could be your work. So that is the benefit of sharing your work. So I ended up selling out of all my pre-orders. I ordered some more and then I, and then eventually I ended up getting these on Nasty Gal, rest in peace. Um, and that was really cool to see my product on a shopping site that I actually you know, bought stuff from, and that was really validating as well. So, silly thing, you know, made a joke about my ex, and then I made a project from it. So you can see that there's starting to be a theme of like, something funny happens, and then you take action on it. And then someone famous happened to share it. Who knew that was gonna happen? And then I got my first wholesale order, so I got to go through that process. I don't really sell a lot of physical products anymore, but it was cool to be able to figure that out on my own and put it together, and it built my confidence. And then, I told, uh, and then in total, I ran this project for three years, and I sold $10,000 worth of product. I might bring them back someday, but right now they are. The idea has been put to rest, so sorry if anybody wanted one. Maybe if you email me, I'll do a small run. So around this time, too, all this stuff is happening with ex-boyfriend tears. I'm still finishing up the Daily Dishonesty manuscript. And I start reflecting on my job situation. And because for, how many people have ever worked in advertising before? Can I get a, okay, decent amount of people. So going to ad school totally did not prepare me for what advertising was actually like. And we were working 10 to 12 hours a day and nothing was selling through. And I started to get a little bit frustrated. It was a good job, but Creatively, it wasn't as fulfilling, so I started to do a little bit of reflecting. And so 12-hour days, I would think about it and go, okay, we're not really selling any work through. Um, you know, I'm canceling plans on friends left and right, and I'm not getting any overtime pay. I'm not getting anything to put in my portfolio. I remember going to our creative director maybe eight months after we had the job because we hadn't sold any work through and being like, are we going to get fired? Are we, are we okay? And he was like, no, it's fine. Like, stuff happens. And then I was looking at my other, other side of my life, which was lettering and doing passion projects and working on actual fun stuff. And I was probably dedicating about 12 hours a week to that versus 12 hours a day. And so I did a little side-by-side -side comparison and I realized, hey, this stuff is fun. It's yielding more results than any of my like, full-time jobs work. And you know, I'm working on it significantly less, so maybe if I just worked on it more and I flipped it around, that would be a good thing. And so being silly was what taught me to take myself seriously. And because of Daily Dishonesty, because of Ex-Boyfriend Tears, I realized it wasn't a coincidence. These silly ideas built my confidence and made me think, hey, I can actually do this. So I quit my job and I started my own little studio, which let's be honest, was in my living room. 
just like most <laughs> budding freelancers. And so at, in the middle of 2014, I went freelance and started Hum Sweet Hum. And the first project I worked on while I was freelance was Will Letter for Lunch. So this is a personal project that maybe four months after going freelance, I decided to make. I had been getting hired for that colorful 3D like style of lettering that Daily Dishonesty was in, and I was worried about pigeonholing myself, and I was like, what if demand dries up? What am I gonna do? So I wanted to expand my portfolio without necessarily trying something completely new. And so what Will Letter for Lunch was, was I was walking around looking for brunch with a girlfriend one day, and we noticed that all of the chalkboard signs outside were really poorly written, and we were a little bit hungover, to be honest, and so she looked at me and she was like, none of these chalkboard signs are really that good. And I was like, yeah, they're not. And she was like, you could probably do them a lot better. You're a letterer. And then I had this light bulb go off where I was like, yeah, I totally could. And I'm normally not like a type snob, but because I was a little hungover, I was a little bit snarky. And so this actually sparked an idea where I was like, huh, what if I did do chalkboard signs? I've never done it before, but if I can do it in pencil, why can't I do it in chalk? So Will Letter for Lunch was born and the concept was pretty simple. I would go around to New York City restaurants and I figured since I had no experience, I could barter. So I went around to New York City restaurants passing out these flyers and I, the concept was whatever I lettered on your sign is what you would pay me. And so I'd go around and if I lettered dumplings, I'd get paid in a plate of dumplings. If I lettered Greek food, I would get paid in a plate of Greek food or a table in this case of Greek food. And I printed out these flyers and I'd walk around during my lunch break and I didn't know what was gonna happen. I was like, well, if no one says yes, then no one knows, you know, I didn't publish anything. But within a week, I had emails in my inbox uh, asking if I would do their chalk signs. And once this project started to take hold of the food industry and the design industry, it started getting shared all over. I even made it into the local New York City newspaper. And I remember thinking like, I didn't invent bartering. Like, I'm not the first person to go into another business and, you know, pitch my services. What about this project is so special? Um, and <laughs> I think that it was because I was, it was something I was passionate about. And it was so simple where I packaged up this design, or packaged up this idea neatly and put it out there and people could understand it really easily. So that's one thing about these kind of silly projects that I've been strategic with is that Instead of having a hodgepodge of work or a whole portfolio, you're giving someone a little free sample of your work and saying, here, try this, or here's a little bit of what I offer. Um, and this project started getting passed around, and within a couple of months, I had an inbox full of requests. I only did one per week, so I wasn't doing too much work for food because I couldn't still have to pay my bills, of course. Um, oh, I think I already had this slide. Never mind. Well, <laughs> take yourself seriously, but don't take your ideas too seriously. I'll say it again. It's important because something as simple as all these ideas I've been talking about are ideas that you might have and then never think about again. How many of you have an idea, get really excited, but then never really write it down or do anything with it, and then like a week later it's gone and you never really do anything? Okay, I hope this talk inspires you to actually take action on those and see what happens because what's the worst that can happen? You know, no one sees it or it doesn't get enough likes. The pros greatly outweigh the cons of sharing your work, even the weird stuff or even the silly stuff. And so I started this project getting paid in cheeseburgers and doing small chalkboard signs. And as time went on, I started doing bigger stuff. Like I got hired by Microsoft to do this video like Christmas card. I'm not gonna play the whole video because it's very long. But then I started getting bigger mural projects. I did a mural at Chobani's headquarters in New York City and I started doing bigger stuff at restaurants. And all these people found out about my chalk lettering work, which keep in mind six months before I had no experience because I started this project that got shared around the internet. And eventually I even landed a Samuel Adams commercial, which is cool. I saw it on TV at a bar one time. Again, if my grandma can see it on TV, it's a big project. So I went from getting paid in cheeseburgers to getting paid in actual money for this kind of stuff. And it's all because I had an idea based on something that happened in my life package it up through my creative skills and put it out there for the world to see. And so one story I love to tell about this project that I recently just started sharing in talks is, like I said, with you know the John Green thing, ex-boyfrontiers, you never know who's looking and you never know who you're gonna meet. So towards the middle of Will Letter for Lunch, uh, there was a food fair near where I had moved to 
And I figured, okay, there's 30 food vendors. I can just be efficient and go pass up my flyers to all 30 of them in like one little area. So I go around, pass out my Will Letter for Lunch flyers, and a week later, I have some emails from some of the vendors who are interested, but I also have this email, and it's someone from Skillshare, and I had no idea how they got my info, and I was like, huh, what's going on? But as you can see, it says, hey, you passed out one of your flyers to our CEO, Michael, and we would love to do a chalk class with you. We've been looking for someone to do a chalkboard lettering class, and we'd love to bring you in. And I went through my memory and I was like, wait, I'm pretty sure I didn't see the CEO of Skillshare at this little food fair. And then I Googled him and realized that yes, indeed I had seen him. He was working at a New Orleans style soup and sweet tea stand. Don't know why, maybe that was his passion project or his silly project, but I happened to hand it to him. He looked like a college kid. And that's how I, booked my first Skillshare class. Um, I went in and talked with them, and they were like, we want to produce this for you. So I said yes to the opportunity. They came in, shot in my studio, and that's how I got, you know, dipped my toes into teaching. And that was what directly led to me building the confidence of like, okay, here's how to put together a class. Here's how to break down my process. That led to me teaching workshops in person, other online classes, and all of this happened because I passed out a flyer at a food fair. So let's recap, Will Letter for Lunch. Wanted some free food. I also wanted to expand my skills, so there was a little bit of a, a you know, practical motivation behind it. But then I made a project, and people shared that project, just like the other ones. And it led to lots of new client work, and it also led to this introduction to people at Skillshare and to me starting to share what I know and teach. So like I said, it's easy to brush off an idea as like, you have it, a little bit excited, and you're like, ah, you know, I don't have time, or you know, I don't, I don't think that'll be any good. But you really never know till you try it out. At least explore it a little bit, because what's the worst that can happen? What I try to do with myself to get myself out of that headset or mindset of, you know, ah, oh, it's not really that big of an idea, is, well, if I made it, what's the best thing that could possibly happen? And as you can see, you know, I've launched lots of passion projects over the years, but. Most of them have led to something really great, even if it's something I couldn't have predicted or if it's three years down the road, you really never know. Um, I was talking with my agent the other day and he was saying how passion projects are like planting seeds for future opportunities. And just like other plants, you never, some plants sprout really fast, some take a long time. And so really you can think of it as just planting seeds for future opportunities. And even if something seems like a silly idea, there's a lot of power in silly because the work that we do, even though we're creative and we love what we do, it can still get hard and it can still, you can still drag your feet a little bit. So especially if anyone is self-employed, doesn't even matter. Keeping ourselves motivated and excited and happy about our work, I think, is essential to the longevity of your career. And so that's why I want to talk about this next project, Flower Crowns. So I promised I'd explain from the beginning. Back at early 2016, it was maybe February, I was browsing through Instagram and I it was about to be music festival season. I don't know if anyone's local here, but you know, February is when all the Coachella ads start popping up and you see the cute flower crowns and the cutoff shorts. And because I'm a letterer, my brain made a pun and I was like, oh, flower, F-L-O-U-R, that could be funny. But then I did that thing that I said earlier where I was like, that's stupid. No one's gonna like that. And then I texted my friends. I texted my best friends, Sophie and Tiffany, asked what they thought and they said it was funny. And so I was like, hmm, maybe it could be a thing. And it excited me. So I was going to my grandma's house for two weeks, you know, shortly after I had this idea. So I ordered all these supplies, sent them to her house, and produced this project. I shot 20 of these in like two days and would just drip them out a little bit. I'll show you some other ones. So here's cinnamon rolls, cupcakes. I think these are wafer cookies and this cool watermelon bread that I found when I was traveling. And so what I would do is I would kind of drip them out on my Instagram, and the number one question I get about this project is, this, huh, this is not a lettering project. Everything else you've done has been lettering and seems to be serving you know, the greater purpose of your lettering portfolio. And there's still a lot of power in doing something that's just fun, that is an interesting concept. This might not have been the same medium, but it was definitely the same tone of voice as the other projects that I've done. And that's one thing that I've used in my career is Using my personality and sense of humor, those things will always stay the same and kind of be in the same vein where 
it doesn't matter what the medium is, if the same tone of voice is coming through, your ideal audience is still going to stick around and like it and think it's funny. And so if anyone, everyone will, everyone will always ask me, weren't you afraid of losing followers? Because, oh, like, God forbid you lose any followers on Instagram. And the best way I've come to think about this is, okay, I want to do an exercise. Has everyone here had trail mix before? Yes. So you know there's always like that one thing in the trail mix that you're like, that there's like a hundred of them at the bottom of the bag because you just picked around them. So whatever that is for you, for me, it's the raisins. You can think of the people who unfollow you because of a personal project that you do as the raisins in your trail mix, the stuff that you didn't really want in the first place. <laughs> and I find that food analogies are a good way to <laughs> get this across. They help me process things too. But the people who are going to stick around for these projects that light you up inside are the people that you want around. If anyone wants to leave and unfollow me because I have bread on my head, probably a good thing because they're probably not going to like the other projects I do in the future, which I will show you in a second. <laughs> and so you can think of it as just filtering through the people who are actually going to support you. Someone who unfollows me because I have bread on my head isn't going to buy my stuff, isn't going to tell their friends about me. You really just want the people who are going to spread the good word about what you're doing because the world is a big place and you don't have to win over everybody, you just have to win over your little corner of the internet. Another question I get about this project is, how do you make these? Like, what is your lighting setup? What, are your, what is your studio? Where are those backdrops from? And I love sharing bits of the process too and not only can you get silly with your concepts and your work, you can get silly with how you present them and how you share your ideas. So I shared this uh, shortly after I published Flower Crowns. This is how I took these photos. This is my grandmother's trash alley. Sorry, Grandma. It's her trash alley. She's a little bit of a hoarder. And I bought these you know, 48-inch rolls of paper online. There's really nothing fancy. There's a little digital camera on a tripod. And it's just me holding up you know, my crowns. And I would just kind of crop them in. And my brother took this photo when we were at my grandma's house. And I remember he took it and he was like, haha, I'm going to share it with the world and show them how you make your stuff. And I was like, you delete that right now. And then I realized it was a good teachable moment because I want you all to know that you don't need fancy equipment to make a passion project. You don't need the things that you think you need in order to start. Half of them that you don't. You can make it work with whatever you have. Use what, do what you can with what you have, right? And so this project was very inexpensive to produce. I batched them all together, dripped them out, and it really didn't lead to much other than the people who stuck around for it absolutely loved it. It got featured on some design blogs, and it was really, this was a for me project because I wanted to start exploring things outside of lettering. That's kind of the gift and curse of being creative is like something that you love doing like lettering you might get a little bit tired of it after five years or 10 years. And so it's our responsibility to switch it up and make sure that we're creatively engaged, playing around with different mediums. And yeah, so with the only thing that came out of Flower, um, out of Flower Crowns that was maybe significant was Wix reached out and was, they were like, hey, we love your project. We'd love to sponsor the Passion Project website. And so I got connected with Wix. I ended up doing some events with them. And again, you never know who's looking at your work. You never know who's in your audience. And so, the takeaway is, if it excites you or it makes you laugh, it's 100% worth doing. Do not write your, do not get in your own way. I find that I do that more often than not, where it's not anyone else who's telling me it's a bad idea, it's me telling me it's a bad idea. And even if nothing significant happens on a career level, you being excited about the work you're sharing and building that connection with your audience too, is super valuable. People still ask me about flower crowns all the time. Helps to differentiate me from every other letterer out there. I don't know any other letterer who does flower crowns or puts food on their head. And so if it excites you, it's absolutely worth pursuing as evidenced by this next project. So this is maybe back in 2016. Um, I had done a little chalk piece in my studio, Foods Before Dudes, and posted it on Instagram. And I remember People were commenting, you know, haha, that's so funny, fries before guys. And someone swooped in there and left this comment, cuisine before peen. And I lost my shit. I thought it was so funny. And of course, not everyone's going to think this is funny. 
But I lost it, and so of course, I tagged my best friends, Sophie and Tiffany, and said, oh my gosh, look at this comment. Best thing I've seen. And for the next maybe six months, my friends and I started saying cuisine before peen. And it became a thing in our friend group. And because I thought it was so funny, I ended up turning it into an idea. So I actually reached out to the woman who posted this, and I was like, hey, I have an idea for a project that has to do with your Instagram comment. I know this is super weird. And she was like, yeah, go for it. I ended up taking her out to dinner, and the rest is history. So, peen cuisine. <laughs> Just switched it, I switched it around a little bit. And so to give you a little backstory, just so it's not completely out of the blue, around this time, so I had been doing flower crowns and got, I got, got good response from that, was feeling excited about it. I was still doing lettering work, of course, but this was my passion project. And because I was starting to venture into the food space, I remember my literary agent who had helped me sell Daily Dishonesty emailed me and she was like, do you have any other ideas for books? Maybe we could do something else. And I pitched her all these different food books, these recipe books, cookbooks, like little food illust illustrated food stories. And she was like, you know, to be honest, I don't think any of these are gonna sell through because your audience doesn't know you for food. They know you for lettering and humor and I don't know if I can sell this for you. And so in the back of my mind too, I was like, oh, I gotta do more food projects then if someday I wanna have a food book. And so that's kind of where flower crowns came from, where peen cuisine came from, also from that funny Instagram comment. And so, as you can, actually, I have no idea if any of you know what's coming. I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen this before if you followed my work. So, because I was so excited about this idea, because it was so funny to me and my friends, I made a dick-shaped cooking blog. We have cacamole, cacprese salad, miso corny, blueberry creamed puffs, chocolate cock pops, and gorgonzola, pear and gorgonzola pizza. And my whole intention with this project was to flip, you know, typical bachelorette party stuff, like food stuff and like ideas are not very well designed. And so my concept for this was, it's so pretty that like you might not even notice it's dick shaped. Obviously these <laughs> screens are huge, so of course you're gonna notice, but like maybe your conservative aunt would like scroll through it on Pinterest and like pin it to her board on accident. That was the intention. And for those of you who follow me, you know I love cooking. And like I started doing the letter for lunch, so there was starting to be a little bit of food incorporated. But this idea I made because I just thought it was so funny. And I thought that what is going to be better than combining my love of food with humor, with potentially positioning myself to get a food book someday? So it's peencuisine.com. I was publishing recipes for a year. Um, I haven't updated it recently because life, um, which I will talk about later. But, you know, when I first launched this project, I did almost get in my own way. And I was like, wait, my career is like starting to take off. Like, do I really, like, do I want to be known as like the dick shaped food blog girl? <laughs> Am I willing to assume that title? Because people say, right, the internet is forever. The internet never forgets. But it kind of does. The internet moves so fast that if you're ever worried about doing a project that you genuinely like and your friends like, but you're worried about what the general public might think, I want you to remember that the internet moves so fast and no one's really paying as much attention to you as you think they are. And so whatever you share, if you are excited about it, it's totally worth doing because even if someone has an adverse reaction to it, like if someone in this room doesn't think Pink Queen funny, that's totally cool. That's totally fine. You don't have to be for everybody. But if you're scared about posting something because you're not sure what the general public will think, you can't please everybody anyway, so you may as well be yourself. And you, know, you can think about it as you're attracting the people who also think that's funny, and you're repelling the people who are like, I don't want anything to do with that. And that is OK. So if you're ever worried, just post it, share it. The pros greatly outweigh the cons. And you know, for people who like it, they're going to be super fans now because they think, oh, that's someone I'd love to hang out with because I think we'd be friends in real life. And so these last two projects that I've shown you are not lettering at all. And what I want, to, what I want you to know from that is people always worry, to ask me, like, are you worried about that messing up your style and people like, not knowing you for lettering anymore? And I always say, don't worry about finding your style. Focus on finding your voice instead. Because if you think about it, think about the outfits you wore in like, middle school, high school. And like, whenever you see those pictures of, pictures of yourself, you kind of cringe a bit. It's because our style changes over time. Everyone, especially creative people, your style will change if you think about the clothes you wear. 
your actual aesthetic style to your work will also change, and that's okay. But if you keep your voice the same, or you figure out what your voice is, what point of view you want to take, what position you want to take, that stuff can carry you through pretty much any style or medium, because no one expects an artist to stick to one thing forever. We're finicky, creative beings, and we need to explore lots of things. Obviously, finding a focus is helpful for business, but if anyone is, is on the fence about trying something new because they're worried about messing up their grid on Instagram or like, you know, des or like desaturating what they're doing, it's okay. You gotta play around and good things can come from it, even if you're just having fun. And when you find your voice, when you figure out what your point of view is and you're not afraid to be yourself and you put yourself out there, it actually empowers other people to be like, hey, that person's being themselves. Why can't I do that too? They're proving that it's safe. They can be that or they can do that or run a Dick Shape Food blog and get away with it. Um, I've still, it's funny because when I was talking with uh, my agent before when I launched Pink Cuisine, I was like, well, okay, we should be aware of these clients that we're working with and like, we'll see what happens. Nothing has happened. I'm on stage here talking with you guys at a big conference. Like, I think people, it's weird because when we look at other people taking risks like that or being weird, we applaud it, but when we think of ourselves doing the same thing, it gets really scary. And so just think of it from someone else's perspective of if someone else saw you being yourself and got inspired by that, that's a really good thing. You know, we're so quick to tell our friends, yeah, have fun, you deserve a break, go for it, play around, like be yourself. But when it comes to ourselves, we don't want to do it. And so when you do find your voice, other people are like, hey, that person's being themselves, how can I do that too? So people started asking me about how do you do all these projects, where do you come up with your ideas? And so I started teaching other people how to do passion projects too and how to extract the silliness out of their life and turn them into these bite-sized free sample projects. And I wanted to show a couple of them to you to show you how this works across all different kinds of mediums. So one of my students, some of you may have seen this around the internet, Nick Masani, incredible letterer. I have everyone's handles here. If you want to take a picture, follow them. They're amazing. Incredible letterer, loved, he used to work for Louise Feely, loved very ornate type, um, old things, intricate stuff. And he started a project called Fosaics where he was making these digital mosaics that look really, really real because he's really talented of, of all the places he would travel to. And he was sharing these, they got, they circulated around pretty much every design blog. He got projects with Airbnb and Society6, and this really helped take his Instagram following to like the next level. And these are just a blend of his passions that he was already interested in. He was probably already looking at these kinds of things, and he just put them together in a nice, neatly packaged project. This is my student, Annie. She did a project called Ovary Actions. Um, she's very passionate about women's health and ending the stigma about menstruation. And so she built these amazing little like clay animations and illustrations um, about period euphemisms. She was like, why, can't, why is everyone so afraid to say period? And so she looked at this long list of all the things people will say instead of saying period. And so we've got riding the crimson wave or surfing the crimson wave. A panty painting, like the people just will people make it worse by not saying period, basically. <laughs> and she posted this, she was very smart about it. And because she does claymation, these took her a really long time. So she built up a collection of these and published them, I think, March 2018 for uh, Women's Month. And this got picked up by a bunch of women's lifestyle sites. Teen Vogue featured it. She got a bunch of work from this. And it's, again, really just a blend of stuff she was already thinking about, already doing, combined, especially with the, these catchy little titles, combined into a neat package. And it, yeah, it took off. And this one, how many of you are introverts? Can I get a raise of hands? Okay. I kind of straddle the line. I think I'm more of an extrovert. But my student, Josh, is an introvert. And he started talking about it online through a project called Intro Flirted where he was making Valentine's like notes or love notes just for introverts. And even as an extrovert, I find these hilarious. My favorite is the we should go out, but not like out, out. I feel like that's the defi definition of me in my late, tw late 20s. I was like, oh wait, how old am I? Yes, but Josh posted one of these every week for an entire year, just one per week, to an Instagram account and to his blog. And this ended up getting featured on design blogs. Huffington Post picked it up. Um, I think Forbes picked it up. 
And it really stemmed from a simple thing of like, I'm an introvert, I'm looking for love, like here are these little love notes. And he even ended up getting a book deal for this. And I remember he reached out to me after he launched this project and he was like, so I've been running the Introflirted account for like a year and it's already got 4,000 followers and I have, I've been running my personal account for like three years and haven't even gotten that close. This is nuts. And so that's the power of, you know, a succinct project too is there's a focus. People know what they're signing up for. It's easy to digest. Um, and people who are introverted or people who know someone who's introverted are going to share this because it resonates with them. So people like to be around the person who's having fun at the party. That really is what it boils down to. When someone's having fun, you know, you think about a party, you're sharing stories, you're listening to other people's stories. If you just make projects that resonate with you and your friends, it opens up a conversation with other people online because the internet's a big place. And you can have a conversation through your projects and actually meet people who are just like you. And when people started asking me how I started doing these projects, I was more than happy to share because it's like sharing your favorite recipe. It just means that someone else gets to eat this delicious thing too. And so share what you know, talk about yourself through your work. And uh, when people see that you are having fun with your work, they're more likely to gather around you. One note I do want to make too is that it can be a pity party if we're talking about parties. You do not have to make it light-hearted and like super, you know, funny. If humor is not your thing, that's totally fine too. If you want to talk about a pity party, you just have to be honest and talk about what you're going through. It's kind of like ex-boyfriend tears. It wasn't a happy event, but I took a light-hearted approach to it. And so if you just talk about what's going on in your life, what's true for you, you will inevitably gather an audience of people, even if it's small at first, who are going through the same things as you do, or who like the same things as you do, and that is really, really powerful. And of course, embrace your inner weirdo, um, as you can tell by all these projects. When you embrace your inner weirdo, you, like I said, repel all the people who are not about that, and you attract the people who are about that. And just think about how one-on-one, -on -one, when you're with your you know, best friend or your small group of friends, how weird you all are. We're all pretty weird around people we're comfortable with. If you can even bring an ounce of that into the public space through your work, of course, you know, you don't have to be the next YouTuber or like Vine Star or whatnot, like being weird just like on camera. You can bring that weirdness into your work and that's the vehicle, that's kind of like your megaphone. And I think that's the power we have as designers is we can shed light on whatever we want because we can make it look good and we can make it look cool. And so when you embrace your inner weirdo, you're just filtering through your audience and attracting people who are just like you. And these are the kinds of projects too, when I started embracing my inner weirdo, that actually led to all the big things. And so to take it full circle, you know, this line of Hallmark cards, I actually landed this project because some of the art directors follow Daily Dishonesty and they wanted it in a kind of, I'll go back, kind of similar style. You can see that 3D um, colorful lettering style. Or this MailChimp um, interview and this artwork that they commissioned, this was because I decided to launch a weird marketing campaign called the Inside Scoop, where I was talking about passion projects and made a little light bulb ice cream cone. And someone from the back end saw that I was using it and wanted to commission this work and feature me. Or this Google project, which is arguably one of the biggest murals I've ever done. This project I got via an Instagram DM. I rarely get work through Instagram DMs, but I got a, got a DM from someone who happened to work at Google and I booked this project. And the stuff I was posting on Instagram was stuff like this. Make today your bitch pancakes, sassy and gassy, follow your fucking dream soup. So it's not necessarily serious stuff. And you wouldn't even say too that like, if you had asked me 10 years ago, is this the kind of stuff that clients would actually take seriously? Would this preclude me from getting any big projects someday? I would have said yes, looking from the outside, looking in. But when you are your authentic self and you embrace who you are, you know, People who run brands are weird too. And so you will attract people who vibe with that and you'll, I just attract quirkier brands because I make quirky projects. I was also posting stuff like this and I wanted to kind of wrap things up by showing this mural that I have in my studio. My motto is work hard, snack often. I have it tattooed in my arms if anyone wants to come see after the talk. They were one of my first tattoos. And what it means is, you know, at the beginning I talked about how, you know, there's all those tropes of like, you know, no pain, no gain, like the hard work stuff isn't always the best, but there is a place for it because I'll be completely honest. I've been running my own business for almost seven years now. 
and it is a lot of hard work. That is half of it. But just because it's hard work doesn't mean it can't be fun too. And so that's why we need to prioritize um, the silliness and the playfulness into your work because it'll keep you excited, you know, throughout. People always talk about the seven year itch, which is probably where about the, about the time that I'm getting to. You have to keep yourself excited and engaged. And, you know, here's a photo of me before I actually started painting the lettering. I thought it would make a good, it actually is one of my most liked Instagram posts, surprisingly. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, having some some bit of you know, chips and ice cream and like having some of your snacks in a diet is part of having a balanced, like healthy diet. You can't just eat healthy food. You also have to indulge sometimes. And I think about it the same way in my career of, yes, a lot of it is hard work, but I need to have those you know, kind of junk foody, creative, like frivolous projects to keep me going. And you know, I'll be honest too, I'm not the best at this. Like I said in the beginning, fear will still creep in even when you're following the fun and it's just going to happen. I just came off of an insane like two, in, two, week, two months of work and I haven't been very good at all of this stuff that I've been preaching to all of you. So I want you to know that this talk is just as much for me as it is for you because I forget this stuff too. And it's totally normal, but we, when you do get to that point where you start to feel burnt out or that you're, the work you've been doing is a little bit heavier, it's important to know that you are in the driver's seat and you can always take it back to a silly place whenever you deem fit. Instead of seeing passion projects or side projects, as we call them, as purely side dishes, you know, some side dishes, if we're talking about food, end up becoming main dishes. Sometimes mac and cheese is a side dish, sometimes it's a main course. And so you have to be in charge of when you're gonna switch those things up. How you create your art, is the actual art. So instead of the end product being what your art is, it really is just the process. And if it's not feeling good to you in the short term, it's probably not gonna feel good in the long term either. And so it's our responsibility to switch things up, maybe focus on something a little bit lighter and prioritize adding playfulness to our work. And so I hope this talk has left you inspired to go be weird and to add some fun to your work. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what all of you will create. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, I can answer them. But if you got to go, you got to go. I think there's free wine in the pavilion. <laughs> Hi, yes. Yes. I do have an ongoing list of ideas that I've had over the years and depending on my schedule, so some of those projects like Daily, Daily Dishonesty, I was a student and so I had a little bit more free time. Oftentimes there's this one week window between when I have an idea and when I should execute it. So if you have an idea and you're excited about it, start getting it on paper now to see if it sticks. Um, Pink Cuisine though is something that I sat on for six months. so. I can't really say. Um, there's kind of like the right place, right time for certain ideas. Keep like a Google Doc or some kind of list of all your ideas in case you ever need them. But my, filter, my filtration, if I can't go off of that gut feeling, is to ask my friends or to think about what would my friends and I like or what do they find funny. Oftentimes, like for those of you who are you know, brainstorming on your own, it's really hard to brainstorm in a vacuum that is your own head. And so find one trusted creative friend or maybe two that like if you're really tight and bounce them off of them because there's also that like too many cooks spoil the soup kind of thing where if you ask your mom what she thinks about your idea, she's not really coming at it with a super informed perspective unless it's about being a mom, then maybe. Um, but in general, my strategy has been you are your own like target audience. Like, so you know what you want, so make that kind of stuff because you don't have to try to appeal to anybody who isn't just like you and your friends or don't try to be something that you're not basically. So yeah, filtering through ideas, go off of your gut. I know that can seem kind of arbitrary because people are like, but what if my gut is wrong? But if you can't do that, ask a trusted friend. Yeah, and also one other practical lens you can put it through is look at your ideas and see which of them are going to lend themselves to the skills you wanna hone right now because what, do you, what is your uh, like creative specialty? Do you do illustration, lettering, design? Uh, UI design? Okay, cool. 
would that be what your like side project would be about too? Okay. Well, anyways, no matter what your creative medium is, think about you know what kind of direction you want to steer your career in. I, I kind of think of side projects and these silly personal projects as like the rudder on the ship. That is where you can kind of point things. So like you look at how I used Will Letter for Lunch to break into chalk. I still do the occasional chalk project, but that was something that I was interested in doing. And it had I not done that, I highly doubt an art director would have randomly approached me just for chalk work. So you can think about like what would be cool to do in like a year from now? What would I love to like have said I've done? And then see which of those ideas, because you might have an idea for a funny photography project or illustration project or meme account, I don't know. And so think about that, you can think about it through a practical lens of which one of these is gonna get me closest to my like current goals. I think that is my best answer. Yes? The follow your fucking dream soup and the make your make today your bitch pancakes uh, were actually food. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't film process video of either, but I do have some behind the scenes um, that I I don't know how I share images with you after this talk. But if you dig on my Instagram, they might be there. But yeah, no, I lettered uh, that on top of soup. It was a really thick butternut squash soup that I made, uh, and then I lettered it with coconut milk mixed with cornstarch and just like laid it on top of the paintbrush. The pancakes were the hardest by far because you have to make the lettering backwards and then cook it and then pour the other batter on top and hope it works. That one I will say, I did clean up edges of the lettering, but the bulk of it was actually done in pancake. Yeah, some people think it's syrup, but it's actually pancake. It tasted disgusting by the way because I went, <laughs> Because it was just going to be for a photo, I went to the dollar store and just got dollar store pancake mix. It was really bad. Any other questions? I'm an open book. I'll go with you first and then you. How do you decide when to switch to your next project? Ooh, that's a good one. So how do you decide to end a project and then begin a new one? Like when, when do you switch? It's really up to you. So the, the thing that really I really love about doing personal work is that especially coming from a agency environment where I felt too constrained in terms of deliverables, timeline, creativity, you have complete autonomy over your personal work. You're the creative director, you're the producer, you're the publisher, and I really love that. So a creative project can be done whenever you say it's done. Uh, you can make an announcement that it's done, you can just stop. If it's no longer serving you anymore or making you excited, you don't have to do it. Like, and one thing I wanted to mention too is you can reap the benefits of a, of a fun passion project long after you're done actually producing it. So something like Daily Dishonesty is still circulating around Pinterest and I haven't done it for like four years. And so think about your passion projects kind of like planting the seeds, right? The internet is just gonna be constantly circulating, even if it's not as much as it was at the beginning, when you put something out there, it still has the potential to be discovered. And so there was a project I did that I didn't have in this presentation, because just too many things, that I made it, it kind of tanked. It did not meet my expectations. Not that many people thought it was as funny as I thought it was. And I still put it in my portfolio. And that's one thing too, is that at the end of the day, if no one else likes it, at least you like it, and you can put it in your book, and it can sit there for as long as you want. And three years later, I booked a project because of it, because an art director happened to be thumbing through my portfolio and saw it and was like, that is perfect for our campaign. So passion projects can start and end whenever they stop serving you. That's kind of the gift and curse of being creative, right? Is we get bored of stuff we love, which is kind of messed up. So think of it too as it's not, when you pick an idea or you pick a style, it's not forever because we're always changing and we're pretty fluid. So whenever you want, whenever it's not serving you. Uh, yes, your question? Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what has been your favorite project so far? <sighs> During, for client work or for? personal work. I was actually talking with someone earlier about how I think my favorite project, my purest project that I've ever done is Daily Dishonesty, even though when I look back at some of those phrases, I was like, oh, I was drinking a lot. <laughs> like, it's all about like going out and getting drunk and eating too much food. I was 21, you know, and I was making stuff like that stuff doesn't resonate as much with me anymore, still a little bit, but 
When you make stuff for the, when you make work about the things going on right now, that's the best you can do. And when you look back on it, it's just kind of like a nice little time capsule. I think that one is my favorite project because I made it from a very pure place of like, this is funny, I'm gonna put it out there, zero expectations. Whereas, because I know the power of passion projects now, I do kind of have expectations when I make them. And that's not a bad thing to have some expectations, it's really not. But when you have such high expectations that you beat yourself up for them, not for your project not reaching them, that's when it gets a little bit bad. And so, yeah, I'd say Daily Dishonesty is probably my favorite. I also, for, from the purity standpoint, I just, I love Pean Cuisine too. I'm not really doing it anymore, but it made me laugh so much. My friends and family loved it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was a weird, it was a weird year of cooking. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and I started, I started the first ones actually at my grandma's house too. <laughs> and my grandma has a great sense of humor. Um, and so I would cook the food and then I would just chop it up and rearrange it and then we'd eat it for lunch. Because <laughs> you know, any good Chinese grandma would tell you don't waste any food. Or any, I feel like any grandma would say don't waste any food. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Mm. So, no, I, I publish everything under my name. This is actually, that's a great question because when I launched Pean Cuisine, my friend had suggested, because I was, I was worried, like, will it impact my career super negatively? Um, my friend was like, why don't you just publish it under another name? You know, that would solve it. You could be anonymous and still reap the benefits of seeing it out there in the world. And I said something really smart at the time, uh, and I was like, I was like, well, I don't know. Anything that I want to put out there, if I'm not comfortable putting my name on it, like, I feel like it kind of defeats the purpose, especially for a project like that that is more out there. It's like, I think the internet in general is becoming more sex positive, body positive, but some people still might not like it. That's cool. But I figured if I don't want to put my name on it, I'm not going to do it at all. So I haven't done that. I do know some artists who are like more anonymous with their work. Um, I don't have a second personal account or another artist name that I go by. It's just all under one umbrella. I did consider that at first. I was gonna make like a new account for flower crowns and kind of less lettering stuff. But I found that just dripping out little bits of the content on my personal feed and then having a separate project website for everything else has worked really well. Any other questions? I'll get to you first and then you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say my paid work is, I pretty much don't get hired for anything else besides lettering. No like photo styling, art direction. There might be a little bit of that incorporated in my lettering pieces now. I do stuff like this, like talk about ideas and I teach workshops and I teach classes. So client work wise, it's still all lettering. And I'd say client work makes up about 55% of my business and then teaching, speaking and all the other things make up the rest. Yes, question. How to find time to do passion projects when you're really busy. So I was talking about this in my workshop yesterday and I really love all the images and talk around like self-care, taking a break, like I'm all about that now. But I will be honest, I was pulling like double duty shifts when I was in school and when I was working full time to work on these projects on the side. And so it was really only because I was super excited about them. And so being excited about an idea can be the thing that helps to carry you through, even when like the work is long and hard. Um, kind of like the stuff, the stuff that you would already be doing anyways in your free time is a good place to start with. If you are really busy, maybe pick that. Because if you're already going to letter and watch Netflix, maybe you could come up with a passion project that's lettering so you can be working on your passion project while you're watching Netflix. For me, uh, another tip I have is breaking up your process into like little chunks. So like with Daily Dishonesty, I would take the subway to work and I would brainstorm phrases for little white lies like on the train, holding onto the pole, stuffed between like 20 other people. And I would write them down on my phone and then I'd get to the office and I'd maybe like do some thumbnails and then do my work, come home and then like turn one into a piece and then take it into Photoshop. So I broke my time up into 15 to 30 minute chunks of 
instead of sitting down and finishing one piece in one go, which is kind of unfeasible for a lot of people, just break it up into little chunks. My one friend Amy made a really good point that if you just work on something 15 minutes a day, over the course of an entire month, 15 minutes a day is a full eight hour workday that you've dedicated to something. And that's really impressive. So 15 minutes a day is better than zero minutes a day. And it, it's hard because it seems like it's not doing anything, but over time, it will be doing something. So that's my best advice. Yes, I'll start with you and then I'll get to you. Ooh. Yes. And so I will say this. I love doing client work, and it does make up like the majority of my business. But I do see client work as if someone's going to pay me money, they do ultimately have the final say. And that's just the, the like, take I've, it's the stance I've taken on it to make myself feel OK, I think, when things don't go right because I think that's why I do so many personal projects is I know that I'm in control, I can do whatever I want, and I know I have that, so I'm less precious with the client work because I know it's well within my control to make whatever weird stuff I want on the side. And so when colors get changed or they add some weird stuff in or the concept you know, shifts directions, yes, of course, it's annoying, but I also know I have this other outlet where it's like, yeah, no big deal. I'm not putting all my eggs in that basket. But yeah, it happens all the time. Like I love what I do, but it's still a job. For anyone who's working full time and thinking about transitioning to freelance or following like what their passion is, it will turn into a job and that's okay. And I think if we're less precious with that kind of work we're doing for the job and we still have other things that we're doing on the side, it makes it feel better. But I really love what I do, but it is still work sometimes. I still get revisions that I don't wanna do. I still get you know late night emails, it still happens, yeah. Uh, question was back there, and then I'll get to you. Yeah, so how did I make the transition between full-time and freelance? So about six months into the job, I was starting to feel unhappy, and I was like, I convinced myself to stay. I was like, oh, it's not, it hasn't been long enough. Like, you should stick it through. But after another month, I was like, I don't know. Like, I was like, I, if this is what it's like now, I'm not sure if I want to do it for another 10 years. Like, this was supposed to be my entire career. And so I started plotting my moves while I was still working full time. So I guess advice I would have is start stuffing away more of your paycheck, save some money. I redid my website. I started reaching out to agents. I started sending out more feelers. Like, there are things you can do before you actually make the jump to make it a little bit more of a hop. Um, and it maybe is just a longer timeline depending on where you're at now. But the best advice I have for you, if, you're, if you have like an inkling that you might wanna do something else someday, start working on it on the side, even if it's 15 minutes a day. Because what happened with lettering was it turned out to be this life raft that I didn't even know I was gonna need or want in the first place. But because I was passionate about it, just kept working on it. And so for me, the transition was fast and like pretty easy, I'll be honest. But if you start to, if you just plan out your timeline and just wait a little bit longer, save some money, start building up your side business, it makes the transition a lot easier than just, when we hear about the jump from full-time to freelance, you just kind of assume someone just like woke up one day and like went into the office and like swiped all the papers off their desk and like left. Um, I'm still friend I thought I was going to be blacklisted from the <laughs> advertising industry when I first left, and it hasn't turned out to be true. I still do a lot of work with old like art directors and creative directors and friends, and so everyone, so in general, creatives support other creatives following their dreams. And so, if you have any anxiety about that, you got to do you. You got to you know what's best for you. I think all of us do have a gut feeling, and we do know what we want, but we try to rationalize why we shouldn't have it, and so. Try to follow your gut, and then you can put a plan in action of take small steps while you're still full-time employed, and it'll make it a lot easier. It's a really boring tip, but honestly, having some savings is probably the best buffer against that, because then you don't have to take on every single project that comes along when you start out, and you could also just give yourself a little bit more peace of mind. Yeah. Question in the front?
Yes, and they're here. Ah! Can you? You don't have to stand up. Um, so Lauren and Crystal, you can wave. Lauren and Crystal are my creative team. Hi. <laughs> uh, I started. I hired Lauren in 2014 as my 2015 as my first intern to help out with a couple lettering things and. You know, no one really prepares you to scale your business as a creative. And also, one thing I want to emphasize is you don't have to scale if you don't want to. It was just the natural progression I took. And in a way, like, especially because so much of my work is online and like Instagram, even if I don't want it to scale, it's going to grow slowly. And so you can think of it as even every time you level up in your business, you're going to encounter new challenges. It doesn't I used to think that like once I reached like Jessica Hish level, everything was going to be chill. And I can tell you that I don't think I've reached that level yet, but things are not chiller than before. They're only chiller in the sense that like I'm not worried about paying my rent anymore. But other than that, there's still a million things going on. I feel like I'm just scraping by every day. Crystal can tell you that I'm a hot mess in the studio. But the work gets done and it gets shipped and I still have a little bit of fun while I do it and that's important. I need to have more fun because lately it's been very stressful. But yeah, if you find stuff in your business that you don't like doing. So the reason I reached out to an agent was because I can talk of money, but I hate pricing my own projects. I really hate it. I hate signing contracts. I hate doing invoices. I'm the kind of person who, even if someone is supposed to pay me and I need to send the invoice, I'll just drag my feet on it because I hate doing paperwork. And so I understand that it's not like a walk in the park to get an agent, but if that's something that you know you don't like to do, you can try to position yourself to get an agent or you can just hire a friend to be your admin and help out. Everybody knows a friend who's like good with spreadsheets and numbers. And it's weird because when someone else is negotiating for you, there's like a weird dynamic where you feel comfortable telling them to ask for more because it's like not you're not the one who's saying it. And so yeah, I, for all of you who are working and building your businesses, if, identify the parts that you love and then the parts that you really don't like. And when you're able to, invest money in outsourcing those things because you can think of it as you have 24 hours in a day, you need to sleep at least six of them. <laughs> and so your creative energy is best spent on a small amount of tasks, actually. And if you're spending three hours a day writing emails instead of drawing or like animating something, that's ultimately doing you, your portfolio, and your audience a disservice because you're not making cool stuff. So figure out a way to outsource it. There are people out there who love writing, who love you know, correspondence, who like marketing, who like doing all the stuff that you don't like to do. You just have to find them. And we have this tendency, too, because we don't want to do it. We think other people aren't going to want to do it, but there are people who specialize in all different kinds of things. So I wish I had outsourced sooner and asked for help sooner because there's no shame in doing so. And it allows you to just free up your time to do what you're good at. Because you can really only be good at a set amount of things. So yeah. Any other questions? Yes? I am working on a new passion project. It's So I didn't have time for it in my talk, but. The way things have gone, you know, everything's kind of a stepping stone. Started with silly projects, moved into sillier projects, and now that I, kind of because of the Will Letter for Lunch introducing me to Skillshare and I started to teach and really love that, my work has kind of hit an intersection of educational but also still silly. And so I can, ooh, I can announce it here. It'll be ready in January. I think that was going to be my launch date. But I'm starting a website called whatthefuckshouldiletter.com. <laughs> And it's going to be a like phrase generator. If you don't know what to letter, I don't know how many of you are lettering artists. It's a bunch of phrases that I myself have written, my team has written, that are just weird and funny and sassy and quirky, and kind of in that vein. And my boyfriend's designing it because he's a friend and dev. And I really like the combination of being a little bit silly, but also it being helpful now. So I've gone away from just doing purely silly projects. And maybe I'll still do it, do those kinds of projects in the future. But that's the next one that's coming out. Like two years ago, I started something called Homework. I don't know if any of you participate, but it was, it's a weekly challenge where I just give a creative prompt. And so what the fuck should I letter is going to be like a step before that of if you're not ready to come up with your own phrases, here are some phrases for you. And Homework started as a way to help my community, but also have a little bit of fun. And it's been going on for like two years now, which is so nuts to me because I can tell you with certainty, I, there's I've never followed through on something for two years. 
I'm a very finicky creative. I fall off the bandwagon all the time. I was just telling a friend earlier that I've never done 36 days of type because I just know I'm going to stop at H because <laughs> like life is going to get busy or whatnot. And so, yeah, that is what's next. And you can expect it hopefully January 1st. That was my tentative launch date. It's almost ready, actually. Yeah. I might even have like a little beta program. So you'll, you'll see. There'll be emails or Instagram posts. Any other questions? I, yes. Ooh, so yeah, um, how's my new location affected my interests or ideas? So I moved from New York, I was there for six and a half years, and then I went to go travel for a year, and then my boyfriend and I moved to Detroit, and we've been there for two years now. I don't know if it's really changed a ton, to be honest, this is gonna sound silly. One of the reasons we left New York is because when you live in New York, you think you're like, oh, I'm gonna go to the Met on my lunch break, and I'm gonna go to Central Park, and I'm gonna go to all these Broadway shows, and you really just end up sitting in your apartment, eating takeout, and watching Netflix. And so I was already kind of a homebody towards the end of my New York stay. So being on the road, working remotely, um, wasn't much different, and then when we moved to Detroit, if anything, it was just kind of that late 20s thing where we wanted a little bit more space and breathing room, and I don't think it's changed a ton because I stay inside 90% of the time. Actually, that's a funny, there's an idea, I'll just be, I'll spitball some ideas that I've had. There's an idea I've been toying with of, I always joke with my friends that when I turn 35, I'm gonna start a lifestyle blog, and it's gonna be called Stay at Home Home, <laughs> and it'll be all fun crafts and activities you can do in the comfort of your own home. <laughs> um, but yeah, to answer your question, I spend so much time inside I, my desk is by a window, if that makes it any better. Um, but I don't think it's really changed too much. I never thought I'd be living in a very cold place like Detroit, but it's been fine because I don't go out very much. <laughs> I feel like this sounds sad now. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> mm? Oh, I see one back there. Hi. Oh, yeah. Grandma has definitely seen Peen Cuisine. She's down with it. Um, I get a lot of my sense of humor from my grandma, too. She's like a pretty cool, progressive lady. I wanted to get her in here today, but it's a little bit far. She is based in LA, though. I grew up not too far away from here, maybe like 30 minutes south of here. So my dad is coming to my talk on Wednesday, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but yeah, grandma's seen it. The whole family's seen it. My dad thinks it's a hoot. My family thinks it's a hoot. Like I said, you, you don't have to be for everybody, but when you do take a point of view or a stance on something or do something that might be slightly polarizing, it's actually a good thing if there are people who are like, uh-uh, not for me. Because if you're even, I guess the best analogy I have is even vanilla ice cream is not universally loved. There's no such thing as the universally loved anything. Some people are going to like it. Some people won't. And uh, I said this the other day in a podcast, but you have to be like cilantro where how many, can I get a show of hands of who's left? Thank you for staying this long. Who likes cilantro? Okay, who wants to be as far away from cilantro as possible? Okay, this is a really cilantro heavy crowd. But cilantro is a really polarizing food, right? Some people will absolutely not go near it. Some people are iffy on it, but most people are like on one side or the other. But no matter if you hate cilantro, I used to hate cilantro and now I've warmed up to it um, as I got older. No matter if someone loves it or hates it, cilantro is going to be on the shelf at the grocery store every time you go. And so you have to be like cilantro and just show up. And if somebody doesn't want you, that's okay, because there's going to be somebody else who will stumble across you and be like, yes, this is exactly what I was looking for. I love this. So be cilantro. Long-winded answer to your question. Anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I've tried making up sewing, but then I still want to make, like, figure out after advice, like, how do you just support? It is a process. So I think it's good to try everything that you want to try. Depending on if you're trying to do your art for a business, you do need curation with a business, of course. And so for me, I think there's, there's a lot of ways to go about it, but for me, because I did daily dishonesty on the side and that just happened to pick up right away, the external validation of people sharing and liking and like contacting me for work was kind of what 
catapulted me into lettering, so I just doubled down on that. I still cook a lot on the side. I like to paint and draw. I don't post everything I do to Instagram. I still like to save. If anything, it feels kind of like secretive to save some stuff for me now, especially that I have a bigger audience online, but I think you have to go with, you either have to go with your gut of what feels the best to make at the time, because you might change your mind later, and that's okay, or you go with what you're getting hired for the most, or what kinds of posts that you're making on Instagram are leading to the most leads or client work or just likes. You can either take a logical approach or an emotional approach. I'm more of an emotional person, but I can't deny that numbers are important too. So if you can't follow your gut on what you like to do or what feels the best to do and you feel like everything's even, maybe take a look at the numbers and see, oh, I've actually booked four branding projects this year compared to like two lettering pieces. So maybe branding is where it's at. But I think that no matter what, I personally lead with what feels the best to make right now because it feels like it comes from a more creative place and you can use the numbers, of course, because there's a time and a place too where like you gotta make money, that's cool. It's okay to wanna make money with your art, but I find that I have the most follow through when I'm coming from a creative place of like, this feels the most fun to make. Because I think the follow through is the hardest part for us as creatives is it's easy to have one idea, it's hard to have an idea and keep it going for a significant amount of time, but it is really beneficial and one thing I want to stress is if you pick something to work on right now, if it was embroidery or it was painting, it doesn't have to be forever. It could be six months, it could be a year, and it's okay to move on to the next thing. If you find that you're medium kind of finicky and you don't know what you want, I would highly suggest doubling down on a voice or a point of view that at least you can carry across all the different mediums. So if you were going to start an art account that was all going to be feminist, like feminist-based pieces, you could do so many different things for that. You could have paintings, you could have sculptures, you could have lettering, photography, whatever it may be. Um, if you just keep a common theme or point of view, tonality, personality, that can help keep a medium to, or keep all the mediums together. On the other side of that, if you feel like you're all over the place with your ideas, you could just pick, this is my one little hack that I give to my students, Pick like a five to 10 color palette, or maybe you're only gonna work in cool tones or warm tones, and just have that go across your work of all mediums. It'll help make your Instagram feed more cohesive already. Even if you have a yellow painting, and then you also have like a warm toned photograph, and then you have yellow lettering, it can help. Um, and so if you're struggling with either of those things, those are the opposite hacks that I have. But ultimately, I think Lisa Congdon says this in her voice, but Qual oh, quantity leads to quality. And so you do have to produce a large amount of work first in order to figure out what those things you like are or what your voice is. And so anytime, if any of you are in that kind of middle range where you've been doing something for a bit, but you're not sure if it's your thing, keep going until you figure out if it is or not. It might just take a little bit longer. And I know it's super frustrating. It's super annoying that the hardest part of building your career is like the first three years and then it gets a little bit easier as you go. But know that it gets easier as you go with experience um, and with your skills building and your credibility building, it does get easier as you go. It's kind of like compound interest where most people quit before the compound interest even really starts to kick in. It's kind of like when people talk about retirement savings, super boring, but that's why retirement savings are important because you have you know, a 40 year time, her this is turning into like a uh, financial <laughs> lesson. My Chinese upbringing is coming out. Um, we'll save that for my next session at an, on another year. But yeah, if you aren't quite sure and you're feeling frustrated, you might just have to keep going. But at the end of the day, if you're not feeling it, there's no point in doing something like cr doing creative work on the side, like personal work that you're not enjoying needs to go because all your personal work, you need to enjoy it. And it might just take a little bit of soul searching to figure out what those mediums or what those topics are. If any of you are stuck, ask your friends what you think, what they think you're good at or what they think could be a direction for you. Oftentimes, our friends know us better than we know ourselves. So ask a trusted person in your life or creative person in your life even better, and that can help. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Do 
I'm not sure actually. So I've thought about it. I don't think the door is completely closed. I'm a big fan of picking work that fits the lifestyle that you want to have. And maybe there could be a future in which I'd want a full-time job. I have no idea. My resume probably looks like shit by now because I've been out of like full-time employment for almost seven years. But I could dust off that old art director resume and see who would hire me as an intern in 2030. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll be doing my own thing, but who knows? And I think that kind of who knows, let's see what will happen attitude is something that's helped keep me going over the years because when you become so married to one specific outcome, you get really hard on yourself when things aren't going exactly how you wanted them to go. I read a really good quote on Instagram the other day. Oh, love a good inspirational Instagram quote about if you can detach yourself from the fear of failure and also the need to succeed and just create from a place of like, this is enjoyable, this is fun, and not needing either, not needing, basically the existence of needing, a lot, needing it to succeed is why we fear failure so much because there is something to fail at. And if you just make stuff, so that's why I said Daily Dishonesty is my favorite project because it really is the only project where I've had zero expectations. And I think it's like one of my best, arguably the worst lettering I've ever done. But I hope that makes you all know too that even when your work isn't technically perfect, sharing it is still better than not sharing it. No one can see that you're brilliant or funny or smart if it stays in your desk drawer or on your iPad or in your sketchbook. So if anything, I like to think of it as share your work as it is now because it's kind of like looking at old middle school yearbooks and you're you, like now you're like, oh, you could kind of get nostalgic about it and you're like, oh, that was, look how weird I look, look, that was cute. You'll be happy that you documented it 10 years from now. So share your work now because I'm sure when you look back, you'll be like, wow. And it'll make you realize how far you've come to. Anyone else? Wow, I've kept you here. Okay. If anyone needs to go, please do not feel obligated. I'm happy to stay. Yeah. What's up? Okay. Um, you mentioned 50% is cheating. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the Yeah. Absolutely. So there's a common misconception the same way in that second or third slide. Art is a hobby, not a real career. There are all these quotes about how, well, we all, I think in like the public education system, teachers don't get paid very well. Like, what is that phrase? Those who can do, those who can't teach, which is really, oh yeah, those who can't do teach. That's really messed up to teachers. I had some really great teachers when I was growing up. And you could argue that all of us here on stage today are like teaching. And so I think teaching is underrated. Um, I started teaching because of that Skillshare class. I got my first taste of what it would be like to teach online. Then I started teaching in-person workshops too. Fell in love with that because it's so rare to be able to connect with people in person now. And after I learned, got some feedback from students in person and learned that, I started teaching my own online classes. I hired a friend to shoot them and like put them out myself and didn't really know what was gonna happen. I remember I invested a couple thousand dollars in videographer, like marketing coach to help me put it together. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna put this out here, see what happens. Worst case scenario, I'm pretty sure I can like recoup the money, see what happens. And online teaching just took off in a way that I didn't think it was going to, to be honest. Because the income I was making from Skillshare was fine. It's like completely passive, which is nice. But I think it's based on views or something. And when I started selling my own classes, I was like, it was kind of like with Daily Dishonesty. I didn't expect that many people to be interested and it totally validated the idea that, wait, people wanna learn from me? And so I kept going in that direction. Kind of like this whole talk, it's like, I like doing stuff that's me and so I almost lump teaching into like personal work. It's kind of the in-house stuff that my studio does. Because I have a larger audience online now, which is generally a good thing, but because I, there are so many people, I find that teaching classes or having classes or offering them allows me to teach a lot of people at once without having to individually um, go to people. And that's what's nice about an in-person workshop, of course, but the internet scales the same way that anyone can see your work online and it can get, things go viral, things um, you know, get shared a lot. With classes, anyone can find it and sign up and so, yeah, it, it was a huge surprise to me, but if anyone hasn't started teaching online and has been toying with it, it'd be good.
Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for staying so long, everybody. See, OK. I want to point this out, too. There were probably 400 people in here to start. And I think I see about 40, 50, maybe, left. So what I was saying about find your people, you're my people. You stayed. Uh, and if anyone is feeling inspired from this talk, one way you can take it a step further, there's an article that a friend sent to me years ago that really kind of brings this mentality in of like just find your people and that's all you really need. It's called A Thousand True Fans, if you want to write it down. If you just type in A Thousand True Fans into Google, it'll probably come up the first thing. But it's talking about how when we talk about artists and creators, the idea of making $100,000 a year is like, like how would I ever do that? And when you think about it, <laughs> we've overstayed our welcome. Um, the idea of getting 10 clients a year to pay you $10,000 for a project sounds pretty daunting, right? I don't even get that many $10,000 projects, to be honest. But if you, his argument is, all you need are 1,000 true fans to support your business to be able to make a living from what you do. If you can get 1,000 people to each give you $100, which doesn't sound as scary, you can make $100,000. And maybe you even lower it to 50, or you can change the metrics a little bit. But the gist is, you really only need a small handful of people to buy into your work and support you in order to like actually have a fruitful career, and you can slowly build off of that. So much of my business, both client work and teaching, has really been word of mouth. And people don't give word of mouth as much credit as they should, because all of you who, are, who stayed, there might have been someone, I didn't even look because the lights are very bright, someone could have walked out of this talk like 30 seconds in and been like, nah, like this isn't for me, and that's totally cool. Maybe like 100 people would. I hope that didn't happen. Um, I, don't think, I don't think 100 people left. But the fact that there are 40 people left here, that's really powerful to me. You could be drinking wine and eating cheese in the pavilion right now, and you're here sitting in this cold room listening to me talk. That means a lot to me, and if you just think about it that way, you just have to find your people who are willing to stay late until the end of something for you. It's like when bands go and play and they're, I've gone to see, see bands play and I'll leave after it's done because I'm like, okay, I could do with or without it. But you know, every show, there are the diehards who stay back and wait for like the encore that comes on 30 minutes later. And those are your people. And those are really the people you should worry about and cater to and whose opinions really do matter. It's not the people who just randomly pass your stuff and they go, eh, like, I don't really know, or people who leave trolly comments on like YouTube or stuff, those aren't your people. They're the raisins in the trail mix. Don't worry about them. You weren't going to eat them anyways. <laughs> Some people really love raisins. Some people really love cilantro. So just think of yourself as you really just have to find a small handful of people. Building a creative career is not as daunting as you think it is. Yes, it's a lot of fucking hard work. But I think what stops a lot of people from trying is the fact that it seems impossible, and it's definitely not. Uh, and so keep putting yourself out there. I feel like I'm just like repeating myself now. You got this. All right, let's go drink some wine and eat some cheese. Thanks for staying. <laughs>